So we have a wonderful keynote for you. I heard Valerie uh, speak at a conference, and she was just magnificent. I went to her workshop afterwards, and she gave such great practical ideas for children's ministry. So I cornered her and uh, convinced her that she should be our keynote here this year. So we're very grateful to her for coming all the way from Kingston just to speak with us here today. Yes, yeah, Kingston. So Valerie Michelson now has her doctorate. So she's the Reverend Dr. Valerie Michelson. I know how much hard work goes into getting that doctorate and everything else that you've accomplished. So congratulations. Welcome, and we look forward to your talk today. Thank you. I want to start by imagining that we are children in the church. We light this candle and remember that Jesus is the light of the world. I wonder if the fan is not going to cooperate with me. We'll try again. When I work with children in the church, I always want our senses to be engaged. I want it to be beautiful and tactile and uh, engage every part of who we are. Imagine you are a child and you go to church every week. I wonder what it's like for you. I wonder what you need from the church to help you figure out who you are in the world, to figure out who you are becoming. Now you're an adult again. Think about these children. I wonder what hopes you have for the children who come to our churches. What hopes you have about their, what their experiences at church will mean in their lives and as they grow up and live into the world around them and as they live into God's story. This morning I want to invite you to consider with me how the Canadian church is shaping our children and to imagine the breadth and possibility of what we have to offer them in Jesus. I want to thank you so much for inviting me here. Catherine, thank you so much for the wonderful, enthusiastic, and warm welcome you've given me. It's so good to be here. There is nothing like this in our diocese, and I pulled our bishop aside last week and said, I'm going to this thing, and they, they acknowledge people who are doing children's ministry, and they are really taking this seriously, and we said, wow, we should copy this. We should do this. This is a great idea. So um, thank you for all that you do. It's so encouraging for me to see this happening. Thank you for Victor, who got my PowerPoints all set up. I'm not so good at this. He got me all ready, and the, the sound people. Um, Bishop Yu, thank you for your words. I'm actually going to follow along the outline you gave us, kind of looking at what it is and imagining what things could be. And thank you all for coming. I'm quite honored that you'd come out on a Saturday to be a part of this, and I hope we can explore this together. I'm going to start with some real theory, and we're going to get to some practical ideas towards the end and in my workshop as well. But I want to start with just something a little bit interactive so you're used to, we're used to talking to each other and communicating. I'm going to ask you to stand up and sit down. Anybody here from the Anglican tradition, you'll be very comfortable with this. Stand up if you agree, and, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, stay seated if you don't. And there's no right answers. We're just getting to know each other right now. Uh, I think children's ministry in the church is important. That's not a surprise. You're all here. I think children are the future of the church. It's a kind of a trick question, isn't it? <laughs> I think children are a central part of the church today. You're all still standing. And uh, certainly that's how Catherine welcomed us this morning. Okay, we'll mix you up again. I like strawberries. Oh, you're all still standing. Okay, I'm a Toronto Maple Leafs fan. Oh, okay. Well, I, I make jokes about this in Kingston. I, I'm not sure if this is um, safe to do in Toronto, but I'll give it a try. I think this is the year for the Leafs. This is it. Okay. Okay, well, wait, wait a second. My next question. I believe in miracles. 
Okay, and all the Leafs fans are still standing. That's great. I knew that would happen. <laughs> um, okay, the problem in children's ministry is a lack of money. Interesting. I wondered what you'd say about that. I had a, I spoke at a conference a few years ago, and a woman said, "We'll f bring us the children. We'll find the money." <laughs> but that might be. Uh, the problem in children's ministry is a lack of volunteers. Okay. The problem is that people just don't care about children in the church. Yeah, that, that's my experience. My experience is people do care. The problem is a lack of kids. Okay. I am, I'm just curious. There's not a right answer to these, depending on our experience. I think the church has an incredible amount to offer our children, but sometimes I feel like we're missing the boat. Interesting. Okay, sit down. Thank you for playing my uh, little mixer, get to know you game. My journey in, oh, whoa, did this? Is this? Okay, I gotta get this working. All right. My journey that led me to start thinking seriously about children in the church began years ago when I introduced my own young children to Sunday school. They were about three at the time. Here they are, Hannah and Kaylee and Karis. They're triplets. They are now 13. I had not grown up in the church, but what I was hoping for was something that would help them discover the deep and richly integrated experience that I had found myself as I came to the church as an adult. But instead, what I found was more like this, a shallow rendering of the Christian story and Jesus packaged to look more like the culture around us than the sacrificial and life-transforming gospel. This contradiction became an important theme for me at my, in my ministry at St. James Church in Kingston. And um, I and a, a very committed team of other parents and leaders wrestled deeply with questions about how to nurture our children in a, the Christian story in a way that would bring them life. So I want to talk about a lot of that journey today. And uh, this morning, I, I started making an outline, and I realized I'm not doing something linear this morning. And often our, our experience working in the church and working with children, it's not a linear thing. It's not, we do this, and we do this, and we do this, and then this is going to happen. Um, if that's the way your mind goes, try to bear with me. I want to cast a vision theologically for what the church can be. I want to look at our Canadian context. I want to talk for a bit about what maybe is going wrong. There's also some things that are going right. The fact that all you are here today is something, shows there's some things that are going right. And I want to imagine what the church could be. So, and we're going to kind of play around with that circle for a bit and spin around to different parts of it and come out the end. Um, several years ago, I had the opportunity to work with some colleagues at Queen's University who are involved with something called the Health Behavior in School Age Children Survey. I'm going to be calling it HBSC. Uh, for any of you statistically minded people, this is a broad determinants of health survey and its purpose is to understand different aspects of child health. It's a global survey and it represents 43 countries, but the particular study and analysis I'm going to talk about this morning particularly uses data from the Canadian survey in 2010. So it's a kind of survey that asks all kinds of questions. Uh, do you usually eat breakfast? Do you walk to school? Uh, do you feel stressed? Do you play sports? All kinds of things. It's a gold mine of data that can help us learn all kinds of things about the behaviors of children and how they relate to how our kids are doing to the child, to child health. And the, the real purpose of the th survey is to help us use what we've learned to help set kids up to thrive. So when we realized, the team I was working with realized we could use this for church ministry, this was just perfect because what we all want is for our children to thrive. By using this instrument, we were able to observe various behaviors around children who are involved in church. So first what we did ooh, was we looked at various risk behaviors and we were able to do an analysis that said uh, statistically minded people this is about a 40,000 sample so it's quite a powerful sample we were able to observe that if you are connected with the church 
There's a protective effect around certain risk behaviors. So for example, you are likely to drink less or smoke less, have um, later sex, so not engage in sex at, a, at an early age. And we weren't surprised to find that because um, there's a strong protective relationship going on with church involvement, and this is, this is a really good thing. Lots of churches and other religious traditions offer moral parameters around how we live and offer protectives to children. So this is something I thought was really good, and lots of studies say this kind of thing. Church is going to offer some kind of protective around risk behaviors. We were still curious, and we have this data right here at our fingertips. So we did another analysis, and this time we looked at more outward-looking pro-social behaviors, helping others, caring, acts of kindness, and it was interesting, but no real surprise, that church, church involvement was related to a higher likelihood of this kind of behavior. So do unto others kind of things, follow the golden rule. And this is a really good thing. This is an important part of following Jesus, isn't it? Of, um, we hear stories of the Good Samaritan. We, we see Jesus doing this kind of thing all the time. So both of these findings are good news. We don't want our 12-year-olds drinking. We want to know that children who are meaningfully engaged in the church are learning how life-giving a life of service and care for others can be. And I found this initial analysis very encouraging. Because, but we were still curious. So far, we were observing that church-connected kids were potentially better behaved and slightly nicer than their peers who were not involved. So we thought, okay, this is a, this is a start. This is something, they're better behaved, they're slightly nicer. But we gotta be doing more than that, right? Like, if, that's, if that's all we're doing, what are we doing? So we thought, what else? And, and there was great excitement. So we took the data and we said, what else? What else are we doing that nurtures our children into life? And, um, because behaviors are important. They're, they're the means to something more, not the end. They're part of what it is to be part of God's story that draws us into life. So if this is all we're doing. We're really missing out. I wanted to know that church involvement didn't just relate to not breaking rules and loving your neighbor. I wanted to know how church involvement related to our whole human personhood. I wanted to know how our engagement with church and through, so with the Christian story impacts who we are as human beings, not just on Sunday mornings, but in every part of our lives. And I had high hopes and high expectations. So we did another analysis. We did all kinds of analyses, and I'm only going to tell you about a, a couple this morning. You can ask me questions about what else we did. This time, I measured church involvement with measures connected to emotional health, such as feelings of loneliness and helplessness and wishing they were someone else. And I chose these for a lot of reasons, because I thought loneliness, we're the community of the church. Surely they're going to be less lonely. Helplessness, we're empowered by God. They're going to feel less helpless. Wishing they were someone else, well, our message is a core message of belovedness. So I was so excited to... Um, plug this all into the computer and, and get the results back. But um, the results were sobering. Enough that we ran the analysis several times to make sure we had it right. Because what we found was that the strong protective trend we had observed around participation in risk behaviors and pro-social behaviors not only seemed to disappear, but church-connected children were in some ways worse off in these areas than their non-connected peers. And this bothered me profoundly because I truly believe that the church has so much more to offer our children than helping them to be better behaved and slightly nicer than their friends. The Christian life is about life. It's about life in all its fullness, not just about the saving of souls for some future in a far off heaven if we happen to behave, but about the whole human experience within the spatial and temporal settings of everyday life. It is an invitation into a new way of being in the world as citizens of God's kingdom. 
It is about life that is not without struggles or challenges, but that holds us in God's gracious and spacious story and grounds the whole of who we are in a dynamic relationship with our creative and loving God. Without glossing over the very real limitations of what a church made up of broken people can be, the church is called to be a community of wholeness that draws us into this fullness of life. And if we offer our children anything less, we are missing out on the gift of the gospel and the gift of what the church can be. I told you I was going to cast a vision, and that's it. <laughs> We're going to come back to that. But I want to now turn to a cultural context and just sit the, what we're talking about this morning in the context of a very rapidly changing and complicated culture around us because that matters a lot to the conversation that we're having. When I speak to people about children in the church and when I talk to kids, which I do a lot, one of the things I love to ask them to think about is, what's it like to be a child today? I wonder what you think. Um, we've already talked a bit. What is it like to be a child today? Any, uh, any thoughts on that? Stressful, okay. Lots of technology. Lots of technology. Programmed. Programmed. What else? Pardon? Overwhelming. Overwhelming, okay. Competitive. Competitive. All kinds of things. Um, I'm, I'm going to show you some of the things I get told. Um, it's busy, it's overwhelming, it's perpetually connected, there are broken families. Um, I have a list of about 30 things, but I don't have room for all, them all up there. It's a challenging time to be a child. It's a challenging time to be human, but maybe it always has been. In other ways, though, it's one of the best times in the history of the planet to be a child. Any ideas why? To be a child in Canada. What's that like? Any positives? Opportunity. opportunity, and kids tell me that. We've got so much opportunity, we don't know what to do with it. What else? Overfed. We're, yeah, we've, but we've got nutrition, right? And we've got sports programs. We've got, I mean, this is very serious. We've got child labor laws. We've got education. We have no girls in Canada who have people saying you shouldn't be educated, at least I hope we don't. We've got antibiotics. That has changed childhood. We've got all kinds of things. Um, the reality is, it's not a good time or a bad time overall to be a child. It's a complicated time. It's, it's good and it's bad. And our kids need our help to navigate this. So if we only have, oh, doom and gloom, the, the culture is so bad, it's, we're, we're really missing it. There's a lot of really, really good things happening and a lot of really good complicated things that are happening and our children need us. We could spend the whole morning talking about this. I'm just going to draw your attention to a few things that I have found really important. Um, we're kind of in uncharted territory for our kids in a lot of ways. They're having to navigate things we never did, like the internet, this book by um, Sherry Turkle, Alone Together, why we expect more from technology and less from each other. A really um, critical and thoughtful look at what the internet is doing for good and for bad uh, for our children and how we can help them. Um, born to buy, the consumer, the commercialized child and the new consumer culture. All these things are feeding into the church and we need to be aware of them and think of ways we can help our kids navigate these. I'm glad to make my PowerPoints available to anybody if you're frantically wanting to write some of these things down so I can email them to you. Um, another one, last child in the woods. To, um, Rescuing Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder. Is anybody familiar with this book? It's a really wonderful book, and I think there's a lot we can learn about why it matters that our kids are growing up so disconnected from nature and the spiritual consequences to that. And he actually has a profound reflection at the end of the book on why this matters to us spiritually. And the hurry child, the sometimes alarming pace of a contemporary life, it's uh, by David Elkind, one of the best ch early childhood educators going, growing up too fast, too soon. So we can keep all these things in mind as we think, wow, um, 
the church, our children are being raised in a cultural context that in many ways is very difficult for them to navigate. And it's not always conducive to thriving in life. And we can help them in the, in the church. We, um, John Calvin has the most wonderful phrase. He talks about the church as a sanctuary of childhood. And I've often wondered, what would it be like if the church became known as the sanctuary? childhood. It's a place that protected our children and nurtured them into life. That would be an amazing thing. Um, I don't think people see us that way, but they could. Uh, here's another one of my favorite questions to ask. Did it come up? Am I, uh, don't have very good aim. Whoa, I'm giving you the answers. Okay, don't look at that. Wait, let me get it off. Okay, what do children need to thrive? Throw out some more answers. What do our children need to thrive? Love? Great. Play. Play. Yeah. What else do they need? Boundaries. Boundaries. Absolutely. Who else has some? Pardon me? Opportunities. Opportunities. Yeah. Positive reinforcement. Positive reinforcement. Confidence. Confidence. Yeah. Honesty. Honesty. They need all kinds of things. I'm not hearing kind of trips to Disneyland. I'm hearing some really fundamental things. Um, I ask teenagers and children and adults this question all the time. Here are some things I've been told. They need play, caring adults, stillness, connection with nature, freedom, downtime, uh, ritual and routine, all kinds of things. Um, I want us to keep this in mind. Oh wait, I've got one more list that didn't make it into my notes. The last um, time I talked about this, people added to it and said they need meaningful and real relationships, connection with nature, space and stillness, generosity and gratitude, not passive consumption. They need a better story to live in than they're often offered by the culture around us. Any ideas where they could get this kind of thing? Don't tell me. They're going to come back to that at the end. Keep these things in mind. Where am I? I've lost my notes. Um, <sighs> I want to take a look at the practical look at the church now. So we set this up, we've cast a vision, we've looked at what children need, what it's like for them. I have argued that the church is potentially one of the richest places in our children's lives. But what the church offers to children on a given Sunday morning, not always, because often some amazingly rich things are happening, but sometimes it can look suspiciously more like the consumption-oriented culture around us than the sacrificial, life-transforming gospel of Christ. With the best of intentions, because we want the kids to have fun. We want them to come. We can quite easily become passive consumers or buy into the lowest common denominator in order to reach our kids. And the way we teach our children about God, the very media we often choose, with the good intention of getting them excited about the Christian faith, are actually in contradiction with the story itself. When what we are offered is the life-transforming, sacrificial, and countercultural story of Jesus, who participated with God from the creation of the world, why would we settle for something like this? <laughs> We laugh, and I laugh too, but it's not funny that this is so easy to find, and this is so pervasive, and um, we can do so much more. Okay, we're going to keep going around my circle. We're going to go back to the Canadian church in specific, because I've got some data for you. Um, I told you about the survey that I've been involved with. If you're a young person in the Canadian church, not always, but more like, likely, um, you're going to have it a chance that you will likely not be involved in so many risk behaviors and be more involved in pro-social behaviors. So this is what the numbers look like. If you like graphs, ooh, I'm not doing well with this. Okay, so if you're involved in church, you see you have a less chance of smoking, less chance of drug, about half the likelihood that you'll um, experience regular drunkenness. Uh, about a third a chance that you'll be involved in drug use and a uh, lower likelihood that you'll be involved in early sexual engagement. So this is, this is good. I'm not saying this is not good. Um, 
you also will have a slightly higher chance of helping and complimenting, lending, sharing, and all kinds of things we ran. Um, these protective boundaries are all things that give us life. And the problem is not that they are happening, but that some other things aren't happening as well. Because remember, this was also true. See, that protective trend has now completely disappeared when we look at things like loneliness and some, wishing you were someone else and feelings of helplessness. In fact, if you are church involved, your chance of wishing you were someone else are actually slightly higher. And your chance of you feeling helpless is actually slightly higher. And we ran a bunch of other things, depression and things like that, anxiety. There's something going on in the relationship with church involvement that isn't giving our kids life in some of these areas. So why is this a problem? Because the Christian community is an invitation into community. And that's why I hope that involvement will relate to a decreased experience of loneliness. The message Jesus gives us is one of empowerment of a loving God who holds the universe in sustaining care. So I hoped it would relate to decreased feelings of helplessness and more resilience. Finally, the Christian message is one of our own unique belovedness. So I hope that church-involved children would experience decreased feelings of wishing they were someone else and more content in, contentment in who God has made them as themselves. So I found these findings very sobering. I wanted to know what was going on both in our theology and in our practice because our theology informs our practice. Because following Jesus is not about keeping a moral code. It's about life. It's an invitation into a new way of being in the world that draws us into a relationship with this dynamic, creative, and sustaining God. And so one of my research com commitments became to reimagine the possibility of what the church can be. I told you that um, there's a lot of statistical strength in this study. Um, but it also left me with more questions than answers. And some research techniques I really like are to use quantitative analysis along with qualitative um, research to talk to people and say, can you help me understand this? What's going on here? So I did interviews with a number of very happy church-connected children in the Kingston area. Children who go to some of our um, I think, strongest, most wonderful, life-giving churches, kids who um, the pastors recommended for my study, all with the real, a real humility saying, we know it might be risky what we'll find, but we really want our kids to thrive. So we're going to invite our kids to participate in your study. And I and, um, interviewed them and absolutely wonderful children. But the kids I interviewed told me straight up that church involvement helps them know the right and wrong thing to do, helps them know how to help others. But when I probed a bit deeper, trying to understand how the Christian life relates to going beyond their behaviors to the whole of their lives, including their embodiment as physical beings, time and again they pointed me right back to moral behaviors. And I want to give you an example of what this looks like. One of the participants I interviewed lived and breathed hockey. He just, he loved hockey. So I said, um, do you think being involved in church, do you think that has anything to do with hockey? Um, no, wait, first I asked, do you think being in church, involved in church impacts the whole of your life or just a part of your life? And he said, I think the whole of my life. So I asked him, would, would church involvement make a difference when you play hockey? And he said, yeah. Definitely. I, and I thought, what's he going to say here? So I tried not to give him too much and just understand him. Can you help me understand that? Well, I guess with hockey, because I'm not melting off to my coach and stuff. So you see, I was asking him about something intensely physical, something that brought him a huge amount of community and joy and challenge. But when he connected it to church, it was entirely connected back to a moral behavior. I wonder if he'd say, I love going fast, or I, I love playing with my team, but it was, it, 
it connects because I'm not mouthing off to my coach. Again, I'm not arguing that the moral behaviors are bad. It's good that we're giving our, our children a chance to learn courtesy. But my fear is, and what these findings suggest, and what many other studies suggest, is that this is all they are getting out of church involvement. And if this is true, they are missing out. Remember, I was interviewing some of the most involved kids from fabulous churches, and they all reported positive relationships with their church. But over and over again, I said, what difference does your church connection make in your life? Uh, probably not a huge one, but I really like my church. It became clear to me that children were learning a compartmentalized Christianity. It had a lot to do with behaviors and not a lot else. And for the most part, it wasn't really making much difference in the lives of the children. I began to understand what I was observing as a missed possibility, because I believe that church involvement and the Christian life have an extraordinary gift to offer our children. And I know this is true because I have seen it. And my guess is you are here today because you believe it too, and you have seen it too. And as much as I'm telling you stories and sharing findings from a sobering study, I think we're here today because we believe in the life-transforming power of the gospel and what the church under the Holy Spirit has to offer. But what we are all too often seeing in the Canadian church is the norm that even in seemingly positive situations, children are often being nurtured in this compartmentalized, morality-centered faith that has little to do with the fullness of life that Jesus offers to us. And there's no question that this is both a theological and a practical concern. We seem to be missing out on understanding and communicating the inherent goodness of our embodiment as physical beings and on the theological truth that we are not saved from the world, but for the world. The physical world is where God meets us in Jesus. And the gospel is not an escape from our bodily reality. And if we can just not do all these things, we'll be OK. But it's a call to live transformed lives in the physical world that includes every aspect of our being. This study suggests that often the essential mission of the church may have become distorted by shallow, disintegrative theologies that, again, put rules or a morality at the heart of the Christian life, rather than a life-giving relationship with God. Um, I'm saying the same thing a number of times because I really want to send home just one message, not a whole bunch. In the church, we focus on teaching our children how to behave rather than helping them see themselves in light of this dynamic and active presence of this sustaining God. And this reflects a grave theological error because the goal of the Christian life is not to be good so we can go to heaven when we die, but to live in the present, anticipating and even participating in a time when God will make all things new in every part of our lives. Rather than imitate the shallow culture around us, the church needs to look more like the counter-cultural cruciform gospel. And when this powerful story of God's sacrificial, transforming love is what we are offered, why would we settle for something like this? I want to take our final few minutes to reimagine the possibility of what the church can be a community of wholeness in a broken world, and a vehicle for inviting God's people into the fullness of life that extends into every part of their lives. The findings that I'm presenting to you are not all negative, and the positive story here should be recognized and celebrated. We can, we're doing some positive things in the lives of our young people, but I still think we can do more. We can nurture our children more fully more holistically and more joyfully with the overall goal of helping our children thrive. There are many talented and creative people working on this and uh, 
you here today are included in that and there are some fabulous resources and many people responding to this need creatively. Um, so there's lots of good news. This conference is part of the good news. Many of you will be in workshops all afternoon just thinking about this kind of question and saying, okay, we, we have a vision for what this can be. Now, how are we going to do this? And I, I was taking a look at the workshops and think these look so great and so practical. I hope that we'll continue to do these things and to share ideas and to um, constructively challenge practices that could be more conducive to life and to put our ideas out there and share with each other. But I want to share just a few applications. I had about 10 and I thought, no, that's too many. I'm just going to share three things that I think are important. And the first, the first is story. The first response I'd have to what I've talked about a story. And I'm going to talk a lot about this um, when I give a workshop in, uh, later this morning. But as, I, as I've been telling you, my study suggested that many children understand the Christian life first and foremost as an invitation to behave. But what if instead we help them to see it as an invitation to enter into God's story and to find their own story intersecting with gods. I love this painting. I wonder if any art fans here would recognize it. It's by an uh, artist, a Russian artist named Vasily Kandinsky, and it's called Improvisation. It's not an easy painting, and that's one of the reasons I like it, because it doesn't gloss over the pain and the struggles we know our children will find in their lives because they are human and they live in a messy, broken world. But the deep reality of the Christian life is that God meets us in every part of our lives and shows us how our own stories are caught up in the larger redemptive story of what God is doing in the universe. So I think approaching the Bible as story and inviting our children to explore it with wonder and imagination is one of the most important things that we can be doing in children's ministry. Um, people already have talked to me this morning. I know there's a lot of great thinking out there about that, and I'm going to talk about it more. But I think a story is a uh, one of the most important things that people are starting to recover. Um, Ivy Beckwith and a lot of her work, um, transformational children's ministry, how story, ritual, and um, one other thing, I can't remember it right now, is just it addresses this in a really, really wonderful day. Uh, Tom Wright picks up this theme a lot. It's become a really, I find it very encouraging how often people talk about this. The second idea of many that you'll have as responses this is an idea that some of my colleagues and I have been working on uh, recently. And it's again using this health survey I've been a part of. Looking at church practices and observing that while Sunday morning worship services and church youth groups and children's ministries have meaningful roles to play in the faith development of young people, a huge amount of time is devoted to these activities. And these things are good, I'm not saying they're not, but a disproportionate amount of time is spent thinking about what we're gonna do for an hour on a Sunday morning. Um, that's not a large proportion of what we're doing in a week. Very little attention, however, is paid to nurturing young people in the context in which they spend most of their time, which is the family home. What would happen if when we thought about nurturing children in faith, Instead of putting even more energy, energy into church-based practices, we started with practices in the family home that we know are positive in terms of child health and well-being, and if we thought about how they could be encouraged as part of church ministry. So I'm uh, working on a project right now looking at the family meal, which has enormous health benefits. If you uh, look at this survey I'm a part of, you look at children who sit down and eat with their family um, um, zero times a week to seven times a week. Those measures of emotional health that I was talking about earlier, loneliness and helplessness, it's a downward graph consistently. The more time you spend around the table with your family, the more health benefits there are. And the family meal has profound um, implications for the Christian life, doesn't it? Jesus was always going to a meal or coming from a meal, inviting himself for dinner, inviting other people for a meal. One of the first resurrection acts that he did was to 
bring his disciples to a meal, and he cooked them that fish breakfast on the shore. In the church, despite strong theological arguments for the centrality of the nurturing of the family, in all of its manifestations as a response to the Christian life, and despite compelling health-based evidence that family contexts benefit children in many ways, we have yet to invest meaningful energy into resource development and to prioritize the formulation of theological messages that encourage regular family practices, such as family hikes or family meals or hospitality or service as a priority in the Christian life. Imagine if this is different. Imagine if we were to develop integrative practices that were rooted in solid health research and rich theology in order to help church ministries become places where our children don't just learn how to behave, but become places that nurture our children toward flourishing in every part of who they are. I think it would be wonderful. Um, my final application of hundreds, spirituality. I noticed that there's a workshop this afternoon with Amy Crawford. I think Amy, Amy and I have never met, but I think she's here today. Um, what it is and why it matters. I, and I have no doubt that she's going to share some of the most, some of the excellent research about this. Why nurturing spirituality is so important in our children. And... Um, Sometimes this gets lost in our church practices, and this is another study I'm working on right now, is to look at sometimes the way our religious practices can be vehicles for our spirituality in children, but sometimes they can kill the life out of our spirituality. And we don't need to do that. And, and I think there's a lot of reasons that happens, a lot of fear, a lot of busyness. Um, but through the centuries, the spiritual practices of the, of the church connected to stillness and reflection and wondering and relationships meet some of the deepest needs, not only during childhood, but as our children grow up, a healthy spirituality shows them something of what it is at the most basic of levels to be human beings. So I think a part of the reimagining that we need to do in the church is to think really deeply about nurturing spirituality in children. And there's some fabulous work on this, and you're going to talk about it this afternoon. And um, so I'm going to leave Amy to talk more about that. There are hundreds more applications. And I hope that you will tell me that the things I've never thought about. We'll share ideas together about how we can respond to this, about how we can develop responsive and resources and share them with others, because our children need us. They need our creative creativity, our energy, our rigorous theology. They need us to help them navigate the uncharted territory around them so they can grow up whole. Um, I nearly finished what I told you I was going to do. We've talked around this circle a couple of times, and hopefully we're starting to make some sense of what the church is now in general in the Canadian context. And we're starting to imagine what it could be. And my guess is you've been imagining uh, what it could be for a long time, and that's what brought you here tomorrow morning. And maybe we were putting a few things together today that you've been thinking about. Um, but. I want to go back now to the list we looked at um, at the beginning. What children need to thrive? What do our children need from us in order to grow up strong and whole, in order to navigate the cultural stories around them and grow into God's fullness of life? And this is what people have told me over the years. This is what you've told me this morning, and I, I read that other list I love. Children need meaningful and real relationships. They need a connection with nature, space and stillness, um, generosity and gratitude, and they need a story to live in that roots them and grounds them. My favorite slide of the whole morning. What does the church have to offer? Any ideas? What does the church have to offer? I hope we're just sitting here thinking so many things I don't know where to start because I find that what happens in this uh, is this, this slide about what children need to thrive at some very fundamental levels translates pretty much perfectly onto the story of what, our what the church 
has to offer. What we have to offer at our very, at our most basic level is what our children need from us most desperately. And the amazing thing is we're so equipped to give this. Um, where, where in the world can, can people, um, we, we have such, I often uh, I pull a gray hair out of my head and put it in a little box and talk about one of the gifts of the church and I say, what the one of the biggest gifts of the church is in this box and I have people guess and then I pull up my hair and it's, people are like, ooh, but it's so amazing that we have this wealth of intergenerational community, people willing to share stories of life and get to know our children and be a web that holds them. Um, and just incredible thing, we have a story to give them, a story that they can find their lives in, in all the complexity and messiness that shows them God's gracious and creative and sustaining love in the midst of it. I love that. The Christian story, in all its wild depth and beauty, has so much more to offer our children and to all of us than an abstract set of rules or a cheap imitation of the culture around us. Through the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit, we are invited to participate in the abundance of life in Jesus in all its beautiful complexity, and so experience glimpses of God's gracious shalom that spills over into the world. And I believe the possibility of breathing new life into the often tired structures of the church are enormous, and Bishop, you talked about that this morning. We are here in the birthing phase of something wonderful, of something that is alive. As we come together in the 21st century, we are building on 2,000 years of God's people in the church thinking about how to nurture children in the Christian faith. We're not starting from scratch. We don't need to. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We'll think of new ideas for our own place and time, but people have been thinking about this for 2,000 years, across centuries and across every culture. By remembering the best of exactly who we are, I believe that the church, through the power of the living God, is uniquely gifted to offer children what they need most to flourish and thrive meaningful intergenerational community. Deep respect for stillness and depth in our fast-paced and shallow world. The prayers of the community, opportunities for service, ritual, a deep commitment to justice and compassion, creativity and imagination, and God's story that draws us in and anchors our lives. This is no coincidence. God set it up this way so that through the church, God's children might be invited into the life that we have been promised in Jesus Christ, and so flourish and thrive. So I thank you. Thank you.